So, time then for the press preview. We'll take your first look at tomorrow's front pages. Uh, it's time to check out those headlines with Whitehall editor of the Financial Times, Sebastian Payne, and The Sun's deputy political editor, Kate Ferguson. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. Uh, very good evening to both of you. We'll speak in a moment. Uh, let's have a look, though, at some of those front pages for you, beginning with The Sun leading on the news that Tory deputy chief whip Chris Pincher has resigned. And it's the same story on the front page of The Guardian with the headline, Tory Deputy Chief Whip Resigned Amid Sexual Misconduct Claims. A Telegraph also leading uh, on Chris Pinch's resignation. Pressure mounts on sterling as trade figures drop to worst level on record, is the headline on the FT. The I newspaper has an exclusive, Theresa May urges Johnson to ban trans conversion therapy story. The teenager jailed for murdering his five-year-old stepbrother, Logan Mwangi, features on the front of tomorrow's Metro. Uh, the Mirror also leads on that uh, horrific story with the headline, Innocent Lost in House of Evil. And uh, the Daily Star reads, Nurse Bernie's out of bed again, referencing Bernie Eccleston's controversial claims that he'd take a bullet for Vladimir Putin. And don't forget, uh, by scanning the QR code that you can see uh, on your screen right now, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us and listen to us discussing them. And I'm joined tonight by Sebastian Payne and uh, also Kate uh, from The Sun. Good to see you both again. Uh, and Kate, let's start with you and this exclusive. It's on the front uh, of your paper. Tory Whip quits over drunken gropes. Uh, and he's written a resignation uh, letter um, after this... Uh, night of, uh, well, you tell us the details. I mean, this is a kind of bombshell story which we broke earlier this evening over at The Sun. Chris Pincher, the Deputy Chief Whip, has resigned today after being accused of groping two people last night at the Carlton Club. The Carlton Club is the Tory party's sort of private members club over in Piccadilly. It's where lots of Tory MPs sort of go after a long day in Parliament. They unwind, usually away from prying eyes, have a few drinks. But what we've found out this evening is that Chris Pincher allegedly assaulted two people at that club last night. He's resigned tonight, writing to the Prime Minister, saying he's embarrassed himself and others and that he had too much to drink. But obviously, these are very serious allegations, which is just going to totally reopen that whole discussion about sexual harassment and assault in Parliament and, and are the Tories once again going to be seen as the party of sleaze? Yeah, Sebastian, plenty more uh, on that story inside the sun. Um, Boris Johnson, he's been away uh, for uh, over a week now. He's coming back from, from NATO and the G7 to uh, a whole load of tricky issues, and this one just the latest. Well, what, what, what an issue for the Prime Minister to come back to. And what a resignation letter as well, that if you look at it on um, page seven of Kate's paper, great story here. It basically says, Dear Prime Minister, I was too drunk last night. That was essentially how he starts the letter and says that his conduct was not what was expected and he was resigning. Um, and it's obviously Chris Pinchip, not many people will know his name. He became the MP for Tamworth in Staffordshire in 2010. Uh, and he was a whip actually under Theresa May. And he was forced to quit as assistant whip, which is number three in the party's party management operation, after allegations were made by Alex Storey. Alex Storey was a former Olympic um, athlete and a Tory party candidate, and he alleged that Mr Pincher had acted untowards towards him. So Mr Pincher resigned. There was an internal Tory investigation. They cleared him, and he came back a year later to the Whip's office as deputy chief Whip. And now he's been several ministers. He was Europe minister, housing minister, all quite low level, not the kind of minister you would see on the broadcast rounds or making big policy announcements. But then the crucial thing about Mr Pincher is, earlier this year, Boris Johnson was in one of yet another spots of bother, and they, he needed to shore up his position within the Tory party. And so he called on Mr Pincher, who has what good relations with a widespread number of Tory MPs, to go back to his old role that he held a good four years ago as Deputy Chief Whip. He took that role to try and short Mr Johnson's position. And then he's been forced to quit. I think the key question is going to be, can he hold the Tory party whip? Because obviously we're knee deep in a sort of re rebooted version of 1990 sleeves with seemingly every week something is happening with a 
Tory MP, because this comes off the back of Neil Parrish, the MP for Tiverton and Honiton, who uh, had to quit after watching pornography in the House of Commons, and Imad Ahmed Khan, the MP for Wakefield, who had to quit and has now gone to prison for child sexual abuse. And it's got the whole ev sleaze about the Tory party again. And the general public, I'm sure, will look at this and just think, what on earth is wrong with Tory MPs? Mm. Where do they find these people who are acting like that? Yeah, Kate, a uh, uh, story on the front of The Guardian as well. Um, uh, uh, your paper is saying that the, you, you understand he won't lose the party whip, that he will be able to stay on as a backbencher. I mean, it, uh, I, I suppose uh, uh, one thing in his favour is that he's admitted this straight away. There's not been any sort of debate about it. He's come out, he's apologised, he's resigned. To be honest, there would be no choice but to admit it straight away. It happened in a public place. There were plenty of eyewitnesses. I think, you know, that the world in which this could possibly have sort of dragged out with denials is just not the world we are living in. I think Sebastian's totally right. The question now is really, can he keep the Tory whip? There'll be plenty of MPs, some of whom have already got in touch with me tonight, very unhappy that he's going to continue to sit on the Tory benches. Now, we've had this before with other allegations um, which Sebastian just went through. And the Tory party tend to keep the whip until or unless a criminal investigation and charge is brought. So it seems that they're trying to hold that line in this case too. Um, so as long as there is no criminal prosecution, that he'll keep the Tory whip. And we know from tonight, from number 10 sources, they're saying the PM thinks he's done the right thing. He's fessed up. He's decided to resign from his front bench position. But, you know, huge, huge unhappiness in the party about this. And I think Sebastian's right. It has the, the party has, there's a danger it's going to start smelling of sleaze. Right, and that's just a bad place for the party to be in and for politics to be in. Yeah, quick thought, uh, quick final thought on this, Sebastian, before I ask you about uh, the latest from Ukraine. I just think the fact is that, um, you know, the Tory party needs to get a serious grip about its cultural and morality issues amongst its MPs at the moment, because, as I said, it's not just about misconduct of drunkenness, of, of, of sexual allegations across the party as well. It all feeds into this culture you saw in the run-up to the 1997 election, of course, when the Tories lost in a landslide to Tony Blair, where it feels as if the party's got a stench of decline to it as well. And, you know, John Major, very famous he did his put up or shut up leadership contest in 1995 for all of his critics saying, look, you need to just get behind me or get rid of me, essentially. Mm. And I think at the moment, um, with these kind of issues about how MPs are behaving and the allegations around them, there needs to be a sort of a real cathartic moment within the party. And don't forget as well, we've got another Tory MP who we are not allowed to name for legal reasons, who's being investigated for, again for sexual harassment. So there's another thing. And of course, you know, this is very raw politics for a moment. If we put aside the victims of this, which are obviously the main focus. But if Chris Pincher is forced to resign, if, say, there were more allegations, there's no indication of that at the moment. But if there were, that's another by-election and another loss for the Tory party. And every time this happens, it just chips away at Boris Johnson's authority, um, which obviously, as we know, is in a pretty perilous state at the moment. OK, uh, we're going to have to go to a break. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to Ukraine uh, in a moment. Thank you uh, for now. Coming up, Bernie Eccleston under fire for defending Vladimir Putin. Uh, we'll be talking about that next. Welcome back. Part two of the press preview. Still with me, Sebastian and Kate. Uh, Kate, let's talk about Ukraine. Russia has uh, had the upper hand, really, for some time, but there has been a victory for Ukraine in the last 24 hours. The Russians have been uh, driven out of this strategically important island in the Black Sea. Yeah, this is Snake Island, which people may remember from earlier on in the conflict, when you had those sort of brave Ukrainian troops trying to hold out against the Russian onslaught. Well, back then, we thought that Russian onslaught was going to go on and on and that the Red Army tanks would be, you know, irrepressible, really. But here we go. We have the Ukrainians getting that island back. And I just think that that's something we're all going to be celebrating, willing them on. And it's sort of a symbolic victory, really, because it was such a heroic first stand and that they've driven the Russians out, I think is a, obviously a great piece of news for Ukraine. And also I think all of the West, right when the world's eyes are on that conflict again, looking at military spending and the role of NATO and the G7 in that. 
Uh, yeah, let's have a look at the front of the Yorkshire Post, uh, Sebastian, and, and focus a bit on that. Uh, UK defence spending going to rise to 2.5% of GDP by the end of the decade. I mean, it's, it, it's clearly welcome news by Ukraine, but is it enough? And is it quickly enough? Because that's quite a time frame when they need that money de and help desperately now. Well, the UK has obviously been at the forefront of sending weapons, money, troops, support, aid, political backing, whatever you want, you can name it. The UK has been the forefront of it with Ukraine. I think in terms of the military spending, uh, this is much needed. It's good. It's a lot of money, £55 billion by 2030. Um, and obviously ramping up the UK's defence industry to cope with that amount of money does take time. The only caveat I would have, though, is going to be inflation, because in Inflation is going to stay and remain high in potentially double digits. That's going to eat into the UK's capital spend, not just defence, but across the whole public realm. So the commitment is great. And as with all these things, let's see how exactly it's going to get delivered. Well, the commitment is great, Kate, isn't it? But, you know, the government have been stripping uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the defence forces uh, over the last 15 years, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, there's probably two things to say about this money. First of all, it's good and welcome that it's increasing. I think all eyes are going to be on the rest of NATO now, who have always struggled to even hit that 2% target. There's talk, or they said today that they were looking to increase their military spending. Really, we need NATO to follow. But second of all, you're totally right. In the background of all this is this huge row about cuts to troop numbers. So the British Army troop numbers is going to fall to, I think it's, it's smaller since the Napoleonic wars 200 years ago. So uh, yes, more money's going in, but still, is that enough? Because what this conflict has taught us is that you can have all of the cyber tech you like, all of the sort of whizzy drones and things, but actually you do need boots on the ground if there's an invading force and you want to repel them. That's what Ukrainians have learned, and that's what NATO are learning vicariously through the Ukrainian con conflict. And ultimately, Sebastian, um, uh, the US uh, is critical to European security. Um, uh, but I guess for, for too long, they've been, or we've been relying on them to, to, to sort of pick up the bills. This obviously came to the forefront during Donald Trump's presidency, where there was a lot of talk and suggestions he might pull the US out of NATO, which, of course, would have been totally disastrous for Western European security. And at that point, France, Germany, the UK all looked as if they would sort of try and but think of a world where the US wasn't involved in NATO, and that never happened. But it's interesting, it's taken Ukraine to really see Germany shift its stance on Russia and on its own armed forces and defence spending. Um, as Kate was just saying, there will be a lot of pressure on the European countries to try and match this. And we've also seen over the past week, because obviously Boris Johnson's been mm. at the G7 summit, at the NATO summit, coming back to the UK tonight after quite a long time away, he's going to have to look at other, you know, about the other things threats to other NATO members. And I think there's a huge concern in Whitehall about the Baltic countries and depending on how Ukraine plays out, whether there's going to be other Russian threats. And I think that's the impetus behind this new spending. OK. And, Kate, in 20 seconds, tell me what Bernie Eccleston's been saying. He's put his foot in it again. Bernie Eccleston keeps saying things he should just not bother saying. So today I think he's <laughs> said take a bullet for Putin. He's a nice guy. The war's all Zelensky's fault. I think his take on the Ukrainian war is a take we probably don't need. Yeah, OK. I'd read, say his read, take on everything is something we don't need. <laughs> read more about that on the front of the star. Uh, Sebastian, Kate, thank you both. We shall chat again in a moment. Uh, right now, we're going to have a look at the weather.